Should yeah. we begin? Yeah. Right. Sure. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Thank you for showing up. Um, <coughs> it's with a little bit of trepidation that uh, that um, we showed up here. Um, but I, first of all, I want to thank Robert for agreeing to, um, yeah, enter into dialogue around this this topic. I'm really looking forward to it. So the plan is that um, I'll say a few words, hopefully for about eight minutes, if I can do it. Um, we haven't spoken about this. We spoke about the 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 title, uh, but we have no idea what each other is going to say or what might emerge in, in uh, the dialogue, and we're hoping that there will be some time at the end as well for, uh, for all of you. So, um, you know, the PCC vision and, and mission is, has been and continues to be at the leading edge of what uh, Joanna Macy calls the great turning, the great turning toward uh, the possibility of a life-sustaining society, is how she normally characterizes it. We heard Rick the other night talk about uh, the emergence of a possible second axial age. That's another way of characterizing the great turning. Brian and Thomas Berry years ago talked about the possibility of an ecozoic age. Many people have proposed different words uh, that, that point to overlapping visions of some kind of major transformation that we've been on the threshold of for some time. And PCC has been, I think, a, a real leader in articulating these visions and um, uh, bringing, bringing them in, into being. So, uh, you know, at the same time, as, again, as Joanna uh, likes to point out, alongside the great turning that is undoubtedly happening, has been happening, we are witnessing an accelerating great unraveling, the unraveling of the very fabric of life on Earth, the unraveling of the civilizational structures, which, you know, despite all of the transformations uh, over the last 5,000 years, have been uh, you know, more or less stable in terms of what we think of as civilization. So, uh, now, it, obviously, there's no there's no certainty around uh, any of these things. There's never been any absolute certainty. But it's hard not to get the impression from where I sit, reading the news every day, the reports that come out every month, new reports, uh, the headlines and so on, that the great unraveling is accelerating. I'm sure you're not, you're not no stranger to these developments and these feelings. So, you know, I do believe in radical uncertainty. I do recognize the uh, irreducible complexity of life, of the planetary situation. Nobody knows what's going to happen. And I do believe in miracles. You know, miracles have happened, uh, and I, I hold out the, the possibility mm -hmm. for miracles. Now, in, um, again, in the work that reconnects that uh, Joanna Macy uh, has developed and practiced, and that I and many others, including Lydia, have been working closely with uh, over the years. There's some practices that we do. One of them is the truth mandala, where people sit in a circle, a ritual circle, and, uh, and there are four objects that represent deep emotions, uh, grief, rage, um, crippling anxiety, uh, emptiness, sort of depression. And people, as they feel moved, enter the circle and pick up the, the ritual object and speak, give expression to these deep uh, emotions as expressions of our, the pain for our world in the midst of, of the great unraveling. It's too bad we don't have time to do this sort of exercise here, but maybe you can imagine this as going on in the background as we speak if you need to. But another exercise that we do is, is called the seventh generation. And this is where uh, people allow themselves to become channels, as it were, to embody the voices from uh, our 
uh, descendants who are already contained within us. They're, they're already present in the, the sperm and the ova, the DNA. Uh, they're subtly present, perhaps, as well. And it's, and it's quite amazing how the future beings speak to us. But one of the assumptions of this exercise of the seventh generation is that there will, in fact, be a seventh generation. Uh, and in the last few years, um, Joanna and I have um, felt a, a kind of ethical need to let into our moral imagination the real possibility that there might not be a seventh generation, that we are, in, in some very real sense, in an end time. Now, of course, there have been many end times, and depending on where you sit, there have been many endings. Hundreds of civilizations have, have died thousands of languages and their worldviews, and thus uh, their worlds along with them. There have been many, many, many endings. But, uh, you know, we are at a, an unparalleled end in many ways, the end of, of the Holocene, 12,000 year stable climate, seemingly at the end of a 65 million year evolutionary uh, epoch, the end of the Cenozoic with the six mass extinction and so on. So, uh, we really do seem to be in an end time. Now, the, the idea of an end time is, is core to all, to all of the great world religious spiritual traditions. They all have uh, an, a, a sense, an idea, a symbol, a living symbol of the end time. In the Christian tradition, the, the Greek word is eschaton. There's a whole branch of theology, eschatology, which is devoted to reflection on uh, the, the end times. And the end times are often associated, in, again, in the biblical tradition with uh, the idea of apocalypse. <clears throat> now, we think of apocalypse in terms of massive you know, global or perhaps cosmic destruction uh, and renewal. But the root meaning of apocalypse is uh, lifting of the veil. So what, what the apocalypse, you know, the deeper meaning of apocalypse is a lifting of the veil and thus the, the, uh, the shining forth the true nature of things. We can think back again at the idea of end with eschaton. Uh, another Greek word for end is uh, telos. And you know, telos means end, but it also means purpose and meaning and value. So one of the root meanings of living in an end time, as far as I can see, uh, and associated with apocalypse, is that the deeper meaning, the deeper purpose, the deeper value of things starts to become clear. Okay. So there's an invitation to, to make that present. So, but, but I want to invite us to consider the possibility that, uh, you know, to let into our heart minds this possibility of there may be not being a seventh generation, what would that mean? And it's somewhat similar to, you know, if you were given a terminal diagnosis, and, uh, you know, the, your physician told you, well, you have, you know, just a month to live. What would you do? So we as a species, and certainly or parts of the culture that we inhabit, I think are being invited to, to enter into a kind of collective communal sense of, of a sort of terminal diagnosis. And, and what, you know, what do you do with that? And there, there are many possibilities. One, uh, that um, Jiwa Woodbury, some of you may know, uh, has written a paper on planetary hospice. So there's a new movement called planetary hospice. And you know, just as the compassionate thing to do with individuals uh, facing death is to ease the, the pain of transition and to, to surface the deeper uh, <coughs> layers of meaning that make a life meaningful, that make whatever is left meaningful and full. And there are ways that can, that can be done on a planetary scale as well. But another thing that often happens with a terminal diagnosis is a sudden, urgent sense of unfinished business. Now, if you think you only have a month left, then you, you, you may realize, oh my God, I really need to make amends with this person. I really need to finish this task that I haven't done. <coughs> so what are the, the tasks <coughs> that uh, remain undone? <coughs> Remembering, of course, there is no certainty. We don't know. It, it, well, we do know there will be an end. You know, whether it's, that's right. <coughs> you know, <coughs> whether, whether we have to wait for you know, another two billion years for the sun to expand enough that it boils off our atmosphere and so on. We do know there's an end. But if the end is sooner than we might think, 
and we're, if there's a kind of terminal <laughs> diagnosis at a planetary scale, what would be the unfinished business? And some of the things that occur to me, in this country at least, for instance, would be you know, truth and reconciliation, uh, reparations for the indigenous peoples, the, the, what, what, ha you know, what was done to, to found this country, uh, what, the, what was done to African Americans, what was done to uh, Japan with the firebombing, uh, the Allies and so on. This country has such a deep shadow and there's never been any remorse, never been any apology, never been any reparations to the indigenous peoples, to the African Americans, to the people uh, destroyed in the war. So planetary hospice, unfinished business. Then the third element is just how we live with this individually in our own contemplative spiritual life, and this is something that preoccupies me quite a bit when I'm not distracted by little things. Uh, and um, you know, for me, my uh, my Buddhist practice and my my embodied qigong practice and my root, you know, Christian incarnational practice all come into it, and they have to do, as you know, with uh, meditations on the nature of time uh, and the soul, uh, and to the extent that I'm able to deepen into these things, I am. I can find places and moments where I'm all right with the end. You know, first of all, with my own inevitable demise and uh, the apparent demise of the planet. I could say more, but I want to pass it over to you. Okay, you thank you, Sean. Yeah. It's very rich and, and very important. So when <coughs> Sean you send me an email or to call? I forget. But anyway, Sean said, would you like to dialogue with me on the end time? And I said, no. Uh, <laughs> and I said, all right. We are good friends. I shouldn't turn down a request of my dear friend. And we are very special friends. Um, I'll think about it. And the next morning, I think very early, I woke up, like as I do every morning, 6 o'clock. I said, OK, I'll do it. Uh, but I didn't say it so cheerfully. I, <laughs> I said it nervously. Um, this is deep. And it's hard to be truthful about something very deep. Um, so I want to begin. Uh, so I, I carry these uh, trios. Uh, I more than carry them, I try to practice them. Thinking, feeling, and willing. And the thinking has to do with truth, platonic. Um, truth and um, goodness and beauty. Um, so in res with respect to truth, I want to applaud my friend Sean for seeking the truth on this ultimate question, which I think many of us avoid. The whole civilization is pretty much avoiding it. Um, and even in this community, we don't all face uh, what there is to face in the way of truth of the matter. Now, it's probably not going to surprise uh, some of you that I'm going to speak about a possible big picture, a possible long scenario, uh, which could um, help uh, to mitigate the truth. But I want to say that my discipline is um, to give uh, Sean all the influence um, that he deserves. It used to be David Delancey, actually, who preceded Sean in this truth-telling uh, about the extent of the, the demise, the collapse that we're facing. So um, Sean, I said, I, I know you think about this. I said, well, of course I think about it, and I even know what I think about. I, try, I think about how can I sustain the big picture to which I'm devoted, sort of intellectually and spiritually, without being um, shallow and superficial and self-deceptive about the very precise demanding a process or details. So one of the words that's um, functioning in our community is integral. It comes from the Sri Aurobindo, it's in the school, it's Haridash Chaudhary, it's a lot of us are working on integral with various parts. 
And so what I am trying to do um, and with respect to uh, truth is uh, not in any way diminish or mm, uh, smooth over the details that Sean and others keep digging up uh, in a way that's totally alarming. Not to do that, uh, and at the same time, try to figure out whether there's a relationship between those horrific details and the source of, of suffering uh, that is already uh, operative, uh, and horribly in many parts of the world, but also uh, partly and less so in the privileged part of the world where we are. How can we uh, hold to those uh, very precise uh, um, undoing, uh, unraveling, and still have uh, hope, which I just thought of uh, yesterday, that last time I was here I gave a talk on hope. Um, so the first part of my sort of discipline is thinking. So I try to think honestly about uh, what is real, what's happening, what needs to be done, um, in a way that holds together the big picture and the detail. The other one, the next one, is feeling. Namely, and this is in a way um, much more difficult for me, and perhaps for you, in that uh, I think it's easier to think uh, say about evil or suffering than to uh, feel it. Um, so I've had my whole 55 year career as a professor, so I, I, I get paid to think. Uh, but I don't get paid to feel. And I can avoid feeling, and it's really tempting. And so um, that's, um, I think that's one of the great tasks is to expose ourselves to suffering wherever it is and wherever it might be. And then uh, thinking, feeling, and willing is to stay the course, to continue thinking, continue feeling, and then to do what we can. And I thought Sean's list was really edifying and inspiring and wonderful. Um, and uh, I don't do exactly what he does, but I do other things. Namely, that um, we are in a world in which, which is quite, at the deepest level, it's quite alarming and uh, perhaps even depressing. And so we now have to act over against forces that are um, reducing or threatening, even overwhelming, our, um, our ability to love and our ability to be positive and, and uh, hopeful. So that, that requires action. It requires, it's harder for some people, this, this part, the action part is not hard for me. Uh, the feeling part is hard. And being honest is hard, because if we're really honest, it's a tough situation to, to in, every, in so many levels and layers. Okay, so um, I, now I want to say that uh, when I, th the thinking that I do has a lot to do with reading and, uh, and teaching, writing, and it's more and more about um, a, um, a vast spiritual transformation that might be observable, uh, might be underway first off, and if so, might be observable that has been um, articulated by great figures whom I have found over the years and that I cherish and uh, have a relationship with. Um, and they are the, uh, I guess you'd say four, um, Aurobindo, where I started in 1970, uh, Steiner, whom I took up in 1975, um, Teilhard, who I actually knew in the 60s and then abandoned and then came back to in the, in the 90s. And then uh, more and more I'm thinking the thoughts and feeling and also acting 
on behalf of this Sophia tradition, the divine feminine active in the universe, in the earth, uh, in human nature. Um, and so um, I'm, this is, a, this is a feeling as well as a thinking realm. It has to do with love, it has to do with devotion. It's a bhakti element. Um, <coughs> those three things that I mentioned, thinking, feeling, and willing, came first from the Gita, uh, the transformation of thinking, feeling, and willing. They're affirmed and developed by Aurobindo and reappear, the exact same three, uh, in Steiner. So in this thinking, feeling, willing realm, I'm more and more coloring it or articulating it in terms of an invisible but extraordinarily powerful, compassionate force, uh, which has various names, Guan Yin, etc. but I think of it in terms of Sophia. And this is not, and this is directly relevant to the ecological uh, situation uh, because all the texts about Sophia have to do with earth and uh, the transformation of the material by the spiritual. So um, that's a start of mm. some things that I think about that are similar to what you think about. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I see lovely resonances with um, your three <coughs> yogas and the... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And my own, uh, my own situation. Now, I want to ask you, Robert, uh, one of the differences between you and, and I is I don't have any children. You have children and grandchildren. Uh, so how, you know, what happens internally for you as you imagine, uh, see traditionally this is one of the ways that people dealt with finitude with the inevitability of one's own death is that, well, but there are the children, there are right. our children and so on. You know, I, I don't have that, that path open to me. Uh, you do. It's, um, so what do you, what do, you do with, it's with a, that given, given the, the end times, if they are such? It's a deep uh, and profound consideration and I think about it very often. Um, not so much with my children as with grandchildren. Mm -hmm. What will the world be like? I mean, they're now coming into teen years. What is it like, going to be like in 50 years at the rate we're going? And um, so again, I'm trying to hold attention between f uh, thinking and feeling um, uh, distress, worry, anxiety, um, and on the other side, in tension with it, um, holding a kind of a polarity, um, I, uh, uh, I have a worldview which includes uh, karma and rebirth, and so I'm aware that in some, at some level, in some way that I find appropriate, they have chosen this life. And there will be challenges for them that they, uh, I believe, are capable of uh, encountering and helping to alleviate. So we do everything possible, we being uh, my wife and myself, our children, uh, on behalf of these grandchildren, that they who have come into a world which, as Sean says, is unraveling, uh, that is in collapse, um, I believe that they will be on the side of love and that whatever is needed in the hospice of that time, uh, they will be the caretakers. And I think that the, these wonderful young people, and I see young people everywhere, wonderful young people everywhere, including people in this room who are much younger than me, I, I see um, amazing capacities um, to face challenges and to be heroic in a way that they're ready for. They're, it's their world, it's their, they're just like they, they can do technology without trying. I think that they can handle um, a vast, unpredictable uh, transition. I don't think that, they'll, that the transition is unpredictable. It, what form it will take 
is unpredictable. Mm. So I, um, I again, <coughs> I'm trying to hold this tension between um, worry and confidence that um, these amazing young people all over the world, we just saw an explosion of them in Florida, who are in, amazingly more aware than their parents and grandparents, um, and, um, and come equipped um, to deal with a world that in some sense um, they came for. Mm. It's not an accidental arrival. They came to, to be on the, to do hospice work, if that's the right description. It's and, certainly, justice, and justice work. It's, yeah. And justice work. Mm -hmm. um, and so our task is to help all these young people find their destiny in whatever great work um, awaits them. Mm -hmm. And I say to myself, um, this is going to be hard. I'm glad I'm not doing it because I'm a sissy and, a, and, a, you know, and I'm nervous and et cetera. And they, they seem to have great, um, some of them, um, capacity is the word that comes to mind. They have, they, have, they have the ability to see, to affirm, and to transform. And we don't want to say, well, you know, look, they signed up for it. Um, that's superficial and insensitive. But I think we want to say, at least I want to say, that um, with the help of spiritual beings and human beings on the side of love, that they will find a meaningful life. Maybe a hard one, but hard is not bad. Um, love comes from overcoming evil. So I think that they will find opportunities to transform um, evil, suffering, loss of meaning into um, creativity and love. At least that's my, that's my working, that's my perspective or my attitude or my, my commitment. Shall we? Shall we open it up for some dialogue? One, one thing I wanted to bring up, um, you were talking about um, your grandchildren and the younger generation. Um, I just wanted to bring into that, um, that space, that idea. Um, well, I, I think that our culture has a great amount of ageism. Um, we like to elevate the youngest generation. And not um, unfairly that like we should elevate the youngest generation. Uh, that being said, I mean, sometimes the fullest manifestation of our lives comes not at the beginning of our lives, but towards the end of our lives. And so I, I just want to bring that up, that we can't, uh, it seems unfair to shoulder everything in the youngest generation, and it seems um, untrue, um, because a lot of what it can be accomplished is not going to be accomplished simply by um, those that are fresh into the world, but those of us that have been living in the world and will have been living in the world for a long time. And I think that we, we have this ageism, this tendency to kind of like step back and like, now the world belongs to the young, but no, the world belongs not just to the young, the world belongs mm -hmm. to all of us. And there's a really great yeah. amount that uh, both sides can. Any neglect is not okay. If you neglect the young, it's not okay. The middle is not okay. The neglect, neglect the elderly, it's not okay. Everything is important. Everything has to be done. Um, I'm wondering, yeah. can, can yeah, we, please. maybe we should just have some, let, let's, let's gather a few, a few yeah, good statements idea. first. Doesn't have to be questions, can be, uh, and once we have a bundle, then if there's still some time, um, Robert and I can say a few words. 
Uh, just a second, Joshua, and then Amal. And, mm -hmm. Oh, and then Paul. Mm -hmm. So, just building a little bit on Robert's sense of truth. So, when I think about civilization class, I think about really <clears throat> our ability to sense make. And if you take a systems perspective, I'm not actually going on, going on here, we are biological systems. And the way a biological system survives is it makes sense of its environment. And what it does is it takes in information and then processes that and then makes decisions on that basis. Our information systems are fundamentally broken. We have propaganda, we have information overload, we have technology saturating our senses such that we have essentially lost our ability to properly sense make. And when any organism, be it a small system or a large system, loses its ability to make sense of its environment, it dies. And so I think we can't neglect, I think the biggest aspect of all of this is our sense of truth. It's how do we start to re-establish our truth parameters and our information so that we're actually getting authentic and genuine information and not disinformation, propaganda, and the saturation of our senses. I think it lies there. Sense making and truth. Here it says, keep those two last comments in suspension. Let's not lose track of them. Uh, sorry, I think it was uh, Amal first, and, okay. then, and then, yeah. I, Julian? Okay, you're, you're after Paul, Julian. Yeah. Uh, and then if there's some. Thank you for this really valuable dialogue. Uh, part of what came up for me is the question of how to communicate, not just the facts, because we know that the facts are in many ways just ineffectual in moving people, but the feeling and the reason why it troubles me is because we live in these incredibly polarizing times. And so I constantly feel like I'm walking a tightrope in which I want to embrace and move from a place of love and compassion. But at the same time, I have such an overwhelming sense of grief and rage and despair about the situation on the planet. But if I do justice to any of those feelings, I'm an extremist. You know, I'm crazy, you know, and uh, even like, uh, like I'm a teacher and I've taught a lot of lessons on a lot of different subjects, but the one thing that I taught where I suddenly started getting all these emails from parents was on climate change because the kids would go home and they'd be scared, you know, and they would cry to their parents about how, you know, what's going to happen to this planet, you know, and... That was the first time and only time so far that I've gotten a lot of pushback. And I'm not trying to traumatize 11 year olds, but I'm always wondering how do we bring this forward while doing justice to ourselves, doing justice to the planet in such a way that we don't push away, but we invite other people into the space. So that's just what it brought up for me. Paul and Julian, and then afterwards, perhaps, if there are some, uh, some of the women in the, in the room who haven't. Uh, Paul? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to have to really speak up. One of the things I struggle with myself is how do we who are privileged try to create something that might sustain and survive at the same time as we care for the least of these set of brothers and sisters? Mm -hmm. Julian, and then Laura, then, uh, or Lydia, okay. Recently I was, um, I was, louder? Yeah. Recently yeah. I was uh, coming back from the wilderness where I was in a lot of process around some of this work and these things, and, uh, and I came to talk to a younger friend of mine uh, uh, who sometimes looks to me for some help sorting out the world right now. And, uh, I was expressing to her uh, some of what I was experiencing and, and working with, which is somewhat similar to, to where I saw you going, Bershon, uh, weaving through those dark realms. Um, and she got really mad at me. Uh, and, it, and her expression to me was something like, uh, like, so you're just gonna, 
like lay back and accept it. You know? Mm-hmm. And I think I think I want to presence like that voice of the youth to like for for me and I think for us. It was really it was really important for me to receive that. That like, okay, yeah, actually it is important to go to be present with, with this. And I think maybe like one of the places that I've that I've like stepped in with that is like one kind of beauty in the face of whatever comes is to uh, is to show up with a kind of warriorhood that's unconditionally beautiful and willing to not just be present but also to try. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the youth want that from us. Mm-hmm. I think that's important. So I think just bringing in children is always interesting um, to me for obvious reasons, but. Uh, you know, like the thing that I really always like can't handle and that gives me my own grief and rage and anger is like the just the sadness of it all and like there's literally no room for optimism. And you know, like I love that Sean and I'm so happy to hear you when you always qualify to be miracles and like I like that, but but I really think that like genuine optimism is completely absent. And as a parent like there's no quicker way, or there's there's no more sure way to slow down a child from doing an activity than to make them mad or scared. <laughs> like it literally completely inhibits everything, and it's all about kind of maintaining a sense of optimism and a sense of like can do that gets the shoe on the foot and the kid in the car. And like, and this is a daily struggle. And, and I think that that's one of the issues that we keep running into is that we're not rallying anybody. We're bumming everybody out. We get a bunch of toddlers and shoes all over the place and no one's getting in the car. And like, this is it, you know? And it's like, you kind of have to maybe sing a song, <laughs> you know? And, but, but I feel like there's no room for that optimism, which, which actually gets people to do something. It gets somebody to make a decision at the grocery store to go back to their car to grab their bag rather than choose a plastic one. Like, these are the little things, but if you're bummed and depressed and everything is heavy, that extra step feels like a, a mountain, basically. And that's what the little toddlers are teaching us, you know? And, but that's all. I just, I, I want optimism back. Thank you. Laura. Thank you. There's so many different parts of this conversation that I value. I think what I want to say is that. I personally feel that we need to accept the psychological responsibility of trying to be truth speakers and that it might be unethical to share the information about the great unraveling without understanding about what a human being could need in order to metabolize that information. And There are traditions, entire communities of people who have written long texts about, you talked, Joshua, about the information, being able to filter the information that comes in. And then I want to draw attention to the nexus of the information, of where it kind of integrates. And that every human, right, like part of the complexity is that we can do it in all these different ways. Your optimism is refreshing to me and your need for it. And if someone needs to grieve, how can I be available to that as well? And understand how to make space for that. And I've read studies with children, it's true. The, there was this wonderful study that was done that one of the, the medicine for ecophobia is ecophilia. And that part of what happens when we educate children about climate change is they become afraid of the world. And they already, you know, it's like if they don't have a strong enough depth of relationship to natural systems, it can be fragmented. So I don't know. I, I, 
I think we, I do think we have a responsibility to be able to face what's happening and talk about it without turning away. I think I think that that is fundamental. And there's so much, there's such a wealth of resources for how to be that nexus and how to help invite other people to be that nexus. You know, I we didn't plan to have the singing after this, but it's perfect. Of course, yeah. Um, and there's so many other thoughts that I have about for that as well. Thank you. Yeah, um, may I just remind people that if you are interested in doing the kinds of work that uh, Lydia was talking about, uh, it's a shameless plug, but I mean, for, <laughs> for the great turning course in the fall, if you're, if you're interested, it will be a space to, uh, to engage in, in the work that reconnects uh, yeah. from thinking and feeling and, and, and willing and doing, right? There's an eager question over yes, here. Yes, um, I think, I think but Rosie and then Sabrina, or I don't know who, you two will have to decide. I, did, I couldn't see who had their hand up first. My, my comment is of a similar flavor, so I, mm -hmm. I don't know if that, that. Um, I was going to say that before coming to PCC, and so for the last maybe like five years, I've been researching manifestation techniques and co-creation forms of spirituality. These very like folk, spiritual teachings, they're accessible, they're on the internet, it feels like millions of people are following it, but it's the concept that you create your own reality, which has its own problematic psychology, but also its own opportunities. Um, and then I recently learned about morphic fields from being here, but one thing that I learned um, in this, it was described in a New Age book, um, called like spiritual growth being your higher self, that every time we have a spiritual revelation or we discover how to do something that was previously very difficult or impossible, that we're contributing to a psychic web and other people will have quicker access to that realization. So when people are feeding the psychic energy field of this is an impossible situation, we're headed towards disaster, it makes that web much easier to access in human consciousness. So when you're optimistic about the world situation and you use your imagination and your spiritual practices to imagine solutions, you make it easier on a psychic level, um, you know, if you believe in that or entertain that, for other beings to also do the same. Um, so I think it's a subtle form of activism that can be done in this process. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Robert spoke of thinking, um, feeling, and willing, and you said that feeling is the more challenging one for you, and as your dialogue was happening, I, I have no issue with feeling, and it tends to <laughs> overwhelm me, and I'm like sitting here about to explode with tears, and um, because this dialogue goes so deep, pain and grief, and um, and then when you said, Sean, now let's open it up for conversation. And to me, my initial response, like, I wanted to say, can we just, like, hold each other? Like, can we just cry together? Can we feel this together? And that's my, my personal um, work and fascination is how to make feeling more included in these communities and in these conversations because to me the the shared grief is the doorway to the optimism mm -hmm. like how do we purge that how do we support each other in that and mm -hmm. and because it is really easy for us to think and talk in this community and and then i'll speak for myself i I'm full of feeling, and what do I do with it? And um, and I want to feel like the community that can support the dialogue can support and can be courageous enough to feel together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have time to. Uh, uh, Monica from Libby. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, John. I don't remember, sometimes I would name, but the, last night, uh, the Scottish accent got up on stage, it wasn't her name. <laughs> 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 Joshua. Joshua. 
Well, he said something that really moved me, and it was that, you know, if ISIS can organize uh, the way it has, and um, so quickly, and, and just doing that, in the, the way the, the world works, in, in my view, is that creativity emerges when things are far from equilibrium, this is pre-regime, and, you know, we cannot know what can happen, but it's right there. And it's kind of like what Sabrina is saying, if you focus on the positive instead of just being depressed, I mean, the same, you know, post-war we have the existentialists and all, all this, and, and that's what KR was acting against, really, is, is against the existentialism, to try to inspire somehow hope in people, because it, you don't have to become, you know, spiritual in the way of KR, but you can take the context of what it is that he's talking about and the way that things emerge in the world are so mysterious that who are we to think that we're, we can predict where this is headed in, into the end times or whatever. I, I, I have a deep sense that, that if we're here, then, it, you know, then why can't it finish? Whatever finishing might mean, you know, why can't we complete and, and keep on going in some way? And yes, things will change. We're always going to have dramatic reorganization on different levels. I'm not sure what's going to happen. It's a big mystery. But to become depressed is, is what we must guard against, I believe. Thank you. The, uh, the language of the cosmological powers gives me hope that there's always an evolutionary process. And the, um, the title of Charles Eisenstein's book, the, the More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know is Possible, mm -hmm. is what I see within each member of this community when I drop back into it. So I find that encouraging. And the, the notion that our um, information systems are collapsing, I've been thinking a lot about this recently, about our language and how we are in the, the, the really the messy middle of developing not only a new language within this community, but within, for all, each of our communities that we come from, and how we communicate these ideas. And it is, it, I just, messy is the word I keep coming up with, um, because we're, we're not only learning a new, we're, we're developing the language at the same time that we're trying to teach it. And that is a, I don't know that that's ever happened, really. Um, so our notions of how we're communicating this are, challenging, and yet I am so inspired by this community every time I drop back into it. So that's where I find the hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to share that my own personal, most deeply healing experiences have been in um, altered or expanded states when we get in touch with a very large intelligence that shows that the earth is going to some very good place, that we're in an evolutionary process, that there's a teleology, and, and it's, it's, we're moving towards something much better, much more radical, almost pleasurable than we can imagine. And this framework has been like the background for my entire life. It's kind of not only soothed everything, but empowered me and given me courage and strength. Mm. And when I see when we're in a state that, hey, we're not sure if we're going to make it, we're left feeling disempowered, you know, and we have doubt and we have hesitation and we're like, we don't know. We don't feel supported. You know, and on the other side, if we're like, hey, there's a larger intelligence guiding this process, you're like, you're moving with life, with like a Tao, you know, that goes through everything. So it's up. I have found that just to be absolutely crucial in every area of my life and then showing up in the world. And when it comes to doing like grief, grieving work, you know, like I've also done it, I don't say my mission, but it's just been an orientation towards metabolizing of suffering and fear, you know, for myself and whoever is around. And I couldn't do that and go into wherever that takes me without knowing this is going somewhere well. You know, and actually knowing that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, otherwise you get stuck in this process and, and take that in yourself. It's like I have to have something strong enough to cut through. I'm like, yes, we move towards organization. We move towards wholeness. We move towards healing. You know, we move towards complexifying, you know, in terms of our body and tech and, and so on and unifying. So that's just been like my personal guiding force and one that I guess throughout my life is deepening trust into Thank you. Yeah, I just I'm struck by this uh, very moment, and I think for me that's combining the deepest grief and sadness and anger, but with the miracle of love, truth, 
um, sharing our feelings. And so for me, yes, optimism and hope is, in, is definitely important, but the door to optimism and hope is gratitude. Mm -hmm. and, and gratitude mm -hmm. can occur right now, mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. very moment. Mm -hmm. So thank you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, all things must come to an end. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well played, well played. <laughs> no, uh, but I, I, I hope that if any, I would love to hear from each one of you. I mean, obviously I have a lot more that I wasn't able to express that I would love to share with any of you who are interested in, and also learn from you how you are walking through this. But we do have to, to, to end now. Why don't we skip, why don't we promise a PCC forum for two hours uh, in the coming weeks? Yeah. We could do that, and we can include some, we can include some non-thinking dimensions to it as well, so that it's not just, you know, so that we have a chance to be a little bit more embodied. Uh, and you think we can all end with, can we do a group hug? I'm an optipessimist. I'm an optipessimist. You are, you're, you're the, op the most optimistic. No, it's an optipessimist. Just kidding. Big hug. Let's find the let's find the amiable sway here. Where's the little one? Oh yeah, it's very hurt. I'm right here. Yeah. Oh. <laughs>